Welcome to the Fit Rich Life Podcast, a show where we talk about money, health and fitness, and life mastery, along with the financial independence journey, mindset, and much more. In today's special guest episode, I get to interview J.L. Collins, the author of The Simple Path to Wealth and the newly released Pathfinders, Extraordinary Stories of People Like You on the Quest for Financial Independence and How to Join Them. In addition to his books, he also blogs at jlcollinsnh.com about financial independence. His blog has over 20 million readers. J.L. Collins is known as the godfather of financial independence, and he has so much wisdom to share about the journey to financial freedom, and he's played a huge role in my own money journey since I first discovered J.L.'s Simple Path to Wealth framework back in 2017. In this episode, here are some things you will learn about. One, the power of FU money. Two, what the simple path to wealth is. Three, stock picking versus index investing. Four, the psychology you need to adopt to achieve financial independence. Five, whether you should rent or buy a home and a whole lot more. This is a great show for anyone interested in, in pursuing financial independence as JL shares his wisdom and the wisdom of over a hundred different people who are pursuing financial independence. This wisdom will empower you on your own money journey. Please enjoy a wide ranging conversation with JL Collins. JL Collins, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, Justin, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. So you are called the grandfather of, or the godfather of financial independence. You're the author of The Simple Path to Wealth and the newly released Pathfinders, extraordinary stories of people like you on the quest for financial independence and how to join them. Let's kick this show off by talking about F U money. What is <laughs> FU money, JL? FU money. Well, that's, well, first of all, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> so some people have attributed the, the term to me. And while I, I would love to be able to claim it, that would not be true. Uh, I first came across the idea of FU money in a novel by James Clavell, uh, Noble House, if I remember correctly. And this would have been a novel I was reading in the 70s. By the way, a great novel. And there was a character in that novel, and her goal, as her stated goal, was to have a few money. And that immediately crystallized for me what this amorphous goal I had, I had in my head was. That's what I wanted. And I think today a lot of people uh, equate having a few money as being the same thing as being financially independent. I think that's the more common way to look at it. And that's fine. But my own personal way to look at it is financial independence is when you have enough money that that money is earning enough money for you to live on. So you no longer have to trade your time and labor for money. FU money is all of the stages in between that final destination and when you start. So FU money is simply the money that begins building your, your investments that allows you to be steadily stronger financially and to be able to make bolder decisions. Uh, and, and so it's important, I think, for people to know that this is not an on off switch because sometimes if you're at the very beginning and you're looking and saying, wow, I, I need to accumulate a million dollars or a couple million dollars, that seems like an incredibly high, high mountain to climb. But it's important to realize that just like with your physical fitness, uh, the first moment, first time you go into the gym, you come out a little bit stronger than you were before. The moment you begin investing, saving and investing money, you're a little bit fiscally stronger than you were before. And you, as that progresses, you get steadily stronger and stronger until ultimately you are in fact FI. So I love that for you, money. Yeah. I love the the concept too because and just to really illustrate this for the the listeners and the the viewers is like if you accumulate a, enough money to you know 
take a mini retirement or say no to a toxic work environment or leave, you know, that toxic environment and go look for another job and not have to be stressed about making ends meet. It's, it's an incredible power to, to just know that like, Hey, I have enough money to take care of myself. If, uh, you know, something comes up, I lose my job. I don't like my job. I want to leave my job. And I think it's it's such an incredible, uh, empowering and freeing concept. So uh, I'm I'm grateful that you've uh, you know you may have not like came up with the term, but I think you've had a huge hand in popularizing the term. Um, it's definitely as I was reading the Simple Path to Wealth in your blog, and I read about fu money as I began my own. Fi journey, I was like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to having, you know, larger and lar larger amounts of FU money. And I didn't have to wait, you know, until I became financially independent. I just had to have enough money in place to, to give me more options. Yeah, it's a very compelling concept, right? Very compelling image. And that's exactly how I used it. I, I loved my career. I loved working. I just didn't want to have to do it all the time. So throughout my career, I would periodically step back and, and take many sabbaticals. So the longest was five years. The shortest was three months. I did all kinds of different things in those periods of time until I, I went back to work. Um, and it worked out well. And in fact, you know, towards the end of my career, there was a time when uh, I got kicked to the curb unexpectedly. And, and, you know, having that FU money really made, made a huge difference. Uh, it was during the uh, tech crash, by the way, at the end of the 1990s, early 2000s. And uh, while I was out of work uh, during that time, my daughter, who would have been about, I don't know, eight, nine, 10, something like that. My daughter and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. And this was a big uh, economic collapse, right? And the, the tech crash. And on the news, there were this image of, of people standing in line to, to go into a soup kitchen, right? And the overview or the over uh, narrative of this thing is here are all these people have lost their jobs. And, and uh, my daughter, it was right, something right out of the depression. And my daughter's watching this. And of course, she knows that I don't have a job that I'm not working. And she turned to me and she said, Daddy, are we poor? And it was a great opportunity for me because I said, no, honey, we're not, we're not poor. And she said, but you don't have a job. And I said, well, that's true. I don't, but we have money that's working for us. And that's the beauty of having FU money. Yeah. So... A term, another term that you've popularized is the simple path to wealth. Could you explain to me and the audience exactly what your definition is for for the term, the simple path to wealth? Yeah, so that one I will take credit for. <laughs> I, that, that, is, that is mine. Uh, and the interesting thing about the simple path to wealth is when I was working on the book, that was the working title that I, I came up with. And candidly, I never liked it. And I thought, well, this is just kind of, I need a working title, you know, on this project and something better will occur to me before I, I finish the book. And it took me three years to finish the book and nothing better ever occurred to me. So that's how it became the title of the book. Well, turns out people love the title of the book and I've grown to love it. Because it really is very precisely descriptive of what the book is. It is truly a simple path to wealth. And the basic formula is avoid debt or get out of it if you have it. Learn to live on less than you make and invest the difference. And if you do those three things, you will wind up wealthy. And not just in money, you'll wind up wealthy in life. Yeah. And... I still remember, you know, before we hit record, I was just telling you about like, I remember the exact time and place I, I like started reading the simple path to wealth. And, you know, I discovered you, you know, kind of, uh, in a meandering, uh, sense from like, I, 
heard a Tim Ferriss podcast with Mr. Money Mustache and started reading Mr. Money Mustache's blog, you know, he referenced you. And then I, I picked up the book, The Simple Path to Wealth, and it was the title that attracted me. I yeah. was like, because I was so frustrated with my money situation for pretty much my entire life because I had always, you know, been good at like earning a sizable salary, but I just couldn't seem to accumulate wealth. I was like, I've made all this money, but I have nothing to show for it. I'm still in debt. Um, you know, I don't have money. Like, you know, I'm not a millionaire. Like, even though I've made tons of money, like, you know, over the years and, just this idea of a simple path to wealth was so attractive. And I was actually on a company meditation retreat. And I remember reading, you know, uh, Mr. Money Mustache's intro to your book. And I was just like, so excited. And, you know, I started to read the book. And I was like, and I had tried to read like investment books before. And the thing I love so much about the simple path to wealth is, it's really like you teach in this incredible way that is more built around storytelling that mm -hmm. ties in the the fundamentals and, and the principles um, and the teaching in a way that is really like actually enjoyable to read. Because I tried to read finance books before and I was like, this is so mind numbing that I like I'm bored out of my mind, but you, your ability to storytell and teach at the same time is, is incredibly powerful. So, um, I'm curious, you know, how you kind of discovered in your own life, this, this concept of having enough money that you, you know, had the freedom to live life on your own terms, to take breaks from, work and, you know, take right. us back to the beginning of, you know, your working career and how you thought about money. Well, taking it back to the beginning probably goes back even earlier than that, because uh, when I was a kid, my dad was self-employed and he was a pretty successful guy. But like a lot of people of his generation, he was a cigarette smoker. And the problem with cigarettes is not only do they ultimately kill you, but they debilitate you along the way. So as my father grew older, uh, his physical abilities, his health deteriorated uh, with this cigarette smoking. And along with the, his deteriorating health, he, he lost the ability to work. He lost the ability to be active. And because he was self-employed, of course, if, if he'd been employed, he probably would have lost his job. But being self-employed, his, his, his ability to work diminished, our income diminished. And so we went from being in very comfortable circumstances to being in very uncomfortable circumstances. And that was a pretty powerful message to me, probably subliminal at the time, but that how precarious relying on your own ability to earn really was. And so I wanted early on to, as soon as I could, have money aside that I could turn to if I ever lost my ability to earn. As I said earlier in our conversation, I liked working. I, I didn't never had the concept of retiring early. That was when I was young. That just wasn't a concept I ever heard anywhere. So it wasn't in my head. And even if I had, I don't think it would have been all that appealing to me. But as I also said earlier, I just didn't want to have to work all the time. And I wanted to be able, I wanted to be sure that if the time came where for whatever reason I couldn't work, that I was not going to be in the dire straits that, that my parents wound up in. So that was kind of the origin of it. But then figuring out how to do this really became a matter of wandering in the wilderness. And when I graduated from college, I came out of college in the 70s, which was a very difficult economic time. You know, inflation was rampant. The economy was stagnant. In fact, they, somebody coined the term stagflation. And it took me two years out of college to get my first professional job. And, um, uh, and I was making $10,000 a year at that job, which probably is equivalent of maybe sixty thousand, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year today. And I kind of arbitrarily thought, well, I am going to 
save and invest half of that money. And I knew that there were people who were living on $5,000 a year. So I knew it was perfectly possible. It was also a whole lot more money than I had been living on both in college and in that two year gap when I was, you know, doing landscaping and whatever else I could pull together to, to make ends meet. So actually living on $5,000 a year was a big step up. And at the same time, I figured if I'm saving and investing half of my money, I've taken a big step towards buying my financial freedom, buying that FU money that, that we were talking about earlier. So that's kind of how I began. And now as I look back on it, 50% seems to me to be a little bit of a sweet spot. Now, a lot of people who are new to this whole concept who come to it, you know, and they'll read that, you know, save 50% of your income and they'll be like, that's just not possible. This guy's insane. You know, nobody saves 50% of their income. Well, I'm here to tell you that people do. I, I have, I have done, and I have known lots of people who have, but even more importantly, and you, you would be one of these from what you've told me in our earlier discussion, there are people who come at me from the other direction and they're like, JL, 50%, that's nothing, man. You know, people ought to be saving 60, 70. I'm saving 80% of my income. Well, I, I think that's awesome. And the important thing to recognize is that if being financially independent is your goal, the higher your savings rate, the sooner you will get there. So, you know, I chose 50%, worked out pretty well for me. If somebody is saving 40%, that'll work out better than it does for most people, but they're not going to get there quite as soon. If somebody's saving 80%, well, obviously they're going to get there a lot sooner than, than uh, somebody doing 40 or 50%. So it's, it's an individual choice and it depends on how much you value your financial freedom. Yeah. If someone had told me, you know, in the beginning of my working career that you could, you know, save 50% of your money, it would have been so hard for me to, to fathom because right. I, you know, I fell prey to, to lifestyle inflation. Like I grew up uh, in a family where money was really uh, tough. And so when I, you know, first started like making significant amount of money, I was like, I wanted to buy all the things and <laughs> live the life that I had been deprived of, of all my life. And I really went through, you know, several years of, you know, not actually, uh, you know, I was spending probably 110 to 120 percent of the money that I was making <laughs> and going into deeper and deeper debt every year. Um, but then when I discovered the simple path to wealth and realized that, like, hey, there's a bunch of people saving 50 percent, um, it really gave me, uh, like the idea that that was a possibility. And in a sense, it also gave me permission to go against the grain of lifestyle inflation because there, there was so many examples of people who are saving 50% or more. Right. And then once you kind of, you know, in the book, uh, you know, the pathfinders, uh, you know, you share the, uh, the, you know, kind of the, the working time uh, mm -hmm. to like when all work becomes optional. And, you know, if, if you're only saving 5%, you're going to be working for 60 plus years. But that then as you get to like 50%, it's around like somewhere around 15 years. And then yeah, as you can a little bit less than that as I was like 12 or 13, I think at 50%. Yeah. yeah. And then as you continue down and that's where I, I like continue to look down that I was like, wait a minute, if I can get my savings rate to like 70, 80%, like if people are doing 50%, like why can't I do 70, 80 or 90? And just seeing that, you know, graph of like, if you can get your savings rate, you know, to X percentage, you have to work this many years before all work becomes optional, meaning you can live off the money that your money makes. And just understanding that concept was so powerful in my own journey because then I realized the power was in my hands. Like, and it was all based on how I chose to live my life and the decisions I made with my money. And I could be, you know, beholden 
to, you know, lifestyle inflation, or I could take a stand for financial freedom in my own life. And ultimately the choice was mine. And that was just like such a powerful uh, realization for me on my own journey. Well, I think that's the important thing is that ultimately the choice is your own. So from my point of view, uh, you know, when, when my books are out there, Pathfinders and the Simple Path to Wealth, um, you know, at least if people pick them up and read them, one or both, at least they will know that buying their freedom is an option. And I think most Americans don't realize that. It never occurs to them that of all the things that money can buy, that's something that they can spend their money to buy. Now, if you read the books, then at least you know it's an option. You might not choose the option. You might say, well, okay, you know, I, I, now I know I could do that, but I'd still rather buy this, that, or the other thing. I, that's obviously not the choice I would make, and it, I don't think it's a choice that's going to benefit you, especially long term. But nevertheless, at least you know that there's another option. I think the real tragedy is people who get to my age, having never been exposed to the, even the concept that they could have done this, and therefore they didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the concepts that you present is this idea that, you know, if you have a savings rate of 50% or above, it doesn't mean that you're not spending your money. It, like you you share this example of how you're having a conversation with somebody and you actually said I actually spent all of my money that I made but I spent it on my freedom and that is so powerful because I think the challenge for a lot of people uh, about creating like a 50% savings rate or above is they feel like they have to deprive themselves Whereas, right. you know, once I discovered this concept of financial independence, I was like, I don't care about the fancy cars. Like, I want to buy my freedom. And like, so I just made it a huge game for myself to see how much money I could save and then spend on my freedom, aka, in, AKA invest. So I was just like, every dollar that I invest is like one more dollar that makes me more and more free. And so I got like so excited about just seeing how much I could spend on my freedom and like how fast I could grow to greater, greater, greater and greater levels of financial freedom. And I, you know, there's the financial side of money, but then there's also the psych psychological side, the psychology of money. Right. And I think that's where like your strong suit is like your psychology around money and the way you teach the psychology around money is like, it's so easy to take on because you teach it in a way that is, uh, you know, possible for anyone. And in the Pathfinders, you literally share, you know, around a hundred different stories of people from all walks of life, all different levels of income, all types of childhood upbringings all over the world. Um, and, and, you know, I loved reading the Pathfinders because it's like, wow, there's like so many different types of people that have achieved or are on the way to achieving financial independence. And like, if they can do it, I think anybody can do it. Yeah. So a couple of things. I, you know, I, I came up with this way of framing spending uh, in, investing has spending in, in a conversation as you alluded to. And because I'd always been struck by this, this line that people seem to draw that if I save and invest money, I'm depriving myself from being able to spend it. And the, the truth is, you know, as, as you alluded to, I've spent every dime that's ever come my way and I've spent them almost immediately, but buying my freedom was just, where I spent a lot of those dimes because for me, there was nothing my money could buy that was more valuable to me. So it never felt like deprivation to me because I was spending my money on the single thing that, that was most important to me. 
that was most satisfying to me. So you think about it this way. You're looking at buying a new car, maybe. And you're saying, well, I could buy a Cadillac. And then I'd be driving around in this fancy, luxurious car, and everybody would be admiring me, which, of course, is probably not true. Those people that are looking at you are probably not thinking, oh, what a wonderful person that is. They're thinking, oh, wouldn't I look good in that car? Anyway, a little, little sidebar there. Um, but you could buy that Cadillac or you could buy a Chevrolet. And that Chevy would get you to all the same places just as reliably as a Cadillac. Plus, you'd have a big pile of money that you didn't spend on the car that you could spend on something else. So we are always, all of us, making those kinds of decisions We're choosing where do we want to spend our money. And if we buy something expensive, then there's less money to spend on the other things we we might want to have. So I think for anybody who reads my books, they will now realize that, oh, of the many things I can spend my money on, and there's almost no limit, one of the things that I can spend it on is my financial freedom. And of course, you do that by buying assets. You mentioned the stories in Pathfinders and... The fact that, you know, you had made a very high income and you've known a lot of people who've made high incomes, and I have too, but who spend everything and sometimes tragically even spend more and go into debt to maintain some sort of lifestyle. Well, those people, as much earning power as they have, are never going to be financially independent. And so one of the things that I hear a lot is, oh, you know, pursuing financial independence is only for people who make a lot of money, you know? Well, the truth is, if you make a lot of money and you use a significant part of that to buy your freedom, then that's obviously an advantage. But just making a lot of money alone is not going to make you wealthy because the vast majority of people make a lot of money, blow through it with no problem at all. The amount of money you make is not what's important. It's the amount of money that you keep. Of course, you keep it by by buying those assets. The thing I love about Pathfinders is that, as you alluded to, it's filled with stories from people all over the world, but also at all different economic levels. And so it's a wonderful rebuttal to those people who say, oh, I would prefer, I would pursue financial independence, but I don't make enough money. Well, I mean, there are stories, and there's a story uh, in Pathfinders from somebody who says, you know, when I was growing up, the rich people were the ones who had flush toilets. There's a story from a guy who was a a migrant uh, uh, vegetable picker when he he was a kid. You know, he was picking asparagus, uh, you know, and who's now worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So... It doesn't matter where you start. If you read Pathfinders, and I'm sure this is true for everybody who's listening to us, you're going to read stories of people who started and are successful from much more challenging circumstances than you face. So one of the warnings that I would put about put out with Pathfinders is if you read Pathfinders, you will never again be able to look in the mirror and honestly say, this can't be done. You can still say, I choose not to do it, but you never again will have the excuse that it can't be done. Yeah, I couldn't agree more because, you know, I went off the deep end in terms of, you know, my own financial journey. Like <laughs> I I dug myself into 80 grand of debt and six years behind on my taxes. And, you know, I lived in the fancy condos, drove the Range Rover, ate out at all the fancy restaurants, you know, spent even more than I made. And when I discovered the possibility of financial independence, I literally, you know, I started tracking my savings rate, you know, which is like, you know, just for the audience, your savings rate is the percentage of the money that you earn that you actually keep after you've like paid all of your expenses. So like, you know, quick and easy, like if you make $10,000 a month and you spend 5,000 a month, you have 5,000 left over. So that's a 50% savings rate. So I actually did an analysis on my Range Rover because when I discovered financial independence, I, 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 still had the Range Rover from my time working in Hollywood nightlife. And I 
saw that I spent $7,200 in repair and maintenance over two years. And I was like, what the fuck? I could buy a car with that money that I spent on repair and maintenance. So I literally sold my Range Rover and bought a Prius that I still own to this day. And it's a 2012 Prius. And, you know, I'm a married man and I'm like, I'm not a car person. Like I can appreciate a nice right. car, but ultimately like I don't need to impress my wife with a fancy car. I just need to be able to, you know, get to the beach and get to the gym and go on road trips. And that's like all that I need. And, and I think people, you know, society like programs us to like, you know, constantly be consuming and keep up with the Joneses and, you know, drive a nicer car than your neighbor. And then when you actually realize like, wait a minute, do I want to drive the nice car or do I want to be financially free? Or have the ability to say, like, hey, I want to take a year off from work because I have FU money. Or like, right. hey, I'm going to stop working at 40, 40 or 45 because I'm financially independent. And that's just a choice. And, you know, similar to what you said, for me, I realized as I went down the path of financial independence, my number one top core person of value was freedom. So if, if I wanted to align my spending with my top core person of value, then I would spend my money on freedom, which for me was like taking the money that I saved and investing it in assets, as you mentioned. So let's talk a little bit about assets. Um, you, you know, in the simple path to wealth, you recommend VTSAX, which is Vanguard's total US stock market index fund, like Explain what index funds are. Why do you prefer VTSAX over the S&P 500? Uh, and we'll, we'll dig a little bit more into that because I have some follow-up questions you know that I want to ask about index <laughs> investing. Sure. Before, before I do that, though, I, I just have to, to comment on your, on, your, on your story about the Land Rover because uh, the moment you had the epiphany that you could buy your freedom and how important that was, suddenly this fancy car became an albatross rather than, than a status symbol, right? And, yep. and, and out, out the door it goes. So again, you know, there are people I'm sure listening uh, who are going to say, well, no, I mean, buying your freedom sounds good. I'd rather have the, the, the Land Rover. And again, it's your money, it's your life, you know, but at least you know that there is the option. Uh, now, you know, 30 years from now, when you don't have any assets and you've lost your job, I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it. You know, I mean, remember your Land Rover, but enough of that. So VTSAX is a, it's an index fund. And as you mentioned, it's, it, it tracks every publicly traded company, company in the United States of America. And that's what an index fund does. It, it picks a certain index in this case, the total stock market, and then it, it strives to replicate uh, that index. So that's the index fund I prefer. Uh, virtually every major investment firm, VTSAX is Vanguard's, uh, and Vanguard is the company that invented index investing. Jack Bogle started Vanguard. He's the one who launched the first index fund, both, by the way, in 1975, which just coincidentally was the year I started investing. Unfortunately, I didn't know about Jack Bogle Vanguard index funding at, index investing at the time. But in any event, um, other investment firms now have similar funds. And while I prefer VTSAX because I prefer being with Vanguard, it's important to note that a total stock market index fund is essentially the same, whether it's Vanguard's or T. Rowe Price's or Fidelity's or Schwab's or whatever. So if your 401k offers those, you're fine. An index 500 uh, or an S&P 500 index fund is an index fund that tracks the 500 largest companies in the United States, right? That's the S&P 500 or the 500 largest companies. So Vanguard has an S&P 500 index fund, as do the others. 
Um, my preference is the total stock market index fund because you get a, a little bit of mid cap and small cap. But the S&P 500 index fund is fine. If that's what's in your 401k, for instance, you don't have a total stock market. There's nothing wrong with it at all. In fact, if you look at the long term performance of the total stock market index and the S&P 500, you'll see they track remarkably closely to each other. The reason for that is these index funds are cap weighted. That simply means that the larger the company, the larger the market cap of the company, the greater percentage of that company the index is going to own. So VTSAX is about 80, maybe even 85% of that fund is made up of the S&P 500. And then those mid cap and smaller caps are the other 15, 20% of it. So they're very, very close in, in their makeup. Either one works just fine. Okay. So, you know, my follow-up question, uh, and one of my, my good, uh, I call him my five best friend. We've, uh, recently, you know, we're both index investors, like, uh, but we, uh, occasionally like to tinker a little bit, which I know you don't recommend. No, and, I don't. <laughs> yeah. And we can talk about that, but we started looking at Vanguard's information technology, um, index fund, um, V I T A X. And then it has a ETF version V G T. And, you know, as we're kind of looking at it, and this just happened over the last like two weeks. And so I was like, oh, perfect. I'm going to interview JL Collins. I'm going to ask him about this. So I'm going to put him on the spot. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So uh, you better be prepared. So basically, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, the Vanguard Technology um, Information Technology Fund, V-I-T-A-X, it's, uh, you know, increased in value by 473% while VTSAX, the U.S. total stock market index fund, has only increased by 158%. So me and my friend are like, well, why don't we put more of our money into VITAX, not necessarily get rid of our VTSAX, but like, couldn't right. we theoretically increase our gains over the next 10 years by like starting to put more of our money into a technology index fund? So I'm just curious what your honest thoughts are about that. Yeah, so great, great question. Uh, And it it goes back to what I was saying earlier about uh, VTSAX being cap weighted, right? So for instance, one of the criticisms of VTSAX that people will have is they'll say, well, because it's cap weighted, the top companies in there are they're all technology companies because those are the biggest companies these days right so if you buy vtsax you're really buying a technology fund because you know the other the rest of it uh, you know all those other stocks are are not nearly as significant in the performance as these top technology stocks which is kind of what you're referring to is you're saying well gee if that's the case then why not just buy a fund that focuses on those top technology? Uh, ben Carlson has a, writes a writes a blog called uh, A Wealth of Common Sense, and I'm a I'm a big fan. And he just had a uh, an article looking at this last year, where what what they call the uh, Magnificent Seven, which are the top technology uh, companies in the country, and they make up the the very top companies in VTSAX and probably the fund you, me- you mentioned, how huge their performance was in 2023. Uh, I forget the exact numbers, but it was a return of 100 plus percent, right? And the rest of VTSAX was kind of a laggard. But he makes the point if you go back to 2022, which was a down year in the market, though that same Magnificent Seven were posting terrible numbers. They were down dramatically because they are, they tend to be more volatile. So that's one reason that you don't necessarily want to focus on those. Or if you do, 
recognize that you are now adding a whole lot more risk and volatility to your portfolio. Right. The other thing, and this is another criticism that that BTSA gets at the moment, is this idea, well, you know, essentially it's just a technology fund because that's the top tier. Well, one of the few advantages of being an old guy is I can remember times when that wasn't true. So technology was not always the top tier of BTSAX. I can remember when it used to be financial companies. I can remember when it used to be um, uh, consumer goods. Uh, there was a time when it was energy companies. So that top tier rotates. And if you buy a sector fund, which is what you're talking about, you are betting that that sector fund is going to continue to outperform all the other sectors. As you point out, for the last 10, if you'd done that 10 years ago, you would have made a sound bet, but there would have been a lot of luck involved. You don't know what the top tier is going to be over the next 10 years. It's easy to say, well, yeah, it's going to be technology because look where technology is. And maybe that's going to be true. But that's not necessarily true. There was a time when you should have said, I'm just going to buy an energy fund because, hey, those are the companies that are at the top. Why have all these? Why have all this tech crap that's just beginning and nobody knows where that's going? I'm just going to buy this tech, this energy fund uh, and not have the rest of VTSAX or the S&P 500. Well, when I own VTSAX or the S&P 500, I don't have to worry about whether tech is going to remain dominant. If it does, I benefit. I gain from that. If it rotates out and something else rotates in, I don't have to guess what that something else is. I will own it by definition. So when I talk about investing in index funds, I'm talking about investing in broad-based, low-cost index funds. Index funds, and that's how index funds started. Now, there's all kinds of index funds. And you can buy index funds focused on all kinds of different sectors, whether it's technology or energy or consumer goods or precious metals. You know, it's it's the list is endless. Those are not what I recommend because when you do that, you're adding a lot of potential risk and volatility to your portfolio. And you're basically saying, I know which sector is going to dominate going forward. And that's just one step above saying, I know which company is going to do better going forward, right? So you could take it to a, a greater extreme and you could say, well, you know, you could buy that index technology fund that you were referencing, or you could just buy the Magnificent Seven, right? Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, that index technology fund has a lot of companies in it. Why buy those secondary technology companies? Just buy the Magnificent Seven. You could take that to a greater extreme and say, well, last year, if I look at the Magnificent Seven, and I don't know which one it was, but one of them would have had the top performance. You know, Microsoft performed better than anybody else. So I'll just buy Microsoft. So you can see the dangerous path that line of thinking leads you down. Yeah, it's definitely a slippery slope. Like you get more right. and more into gambling territory versus, you know, investing. Of, yeah, exactly. Like you're you're trying to beat the market instead of just being the market. And, you know, the the thing I love about your uh philosophy of, of investing is like quit trying to beat beat the market and just be the market because right. you know, over the last hundred years, like the stock market, like it may have gone down in certain years, but like over the last hundred years, like it's continued to go, you know, up and to the right um, significantly. And I think the other day I was looking at a, um, a post and I think over the last 75 to 100 years, like the S&P 500 has gone up. 70, like 75% of the time it goes up and 25% of the time it goes down. Right. And so, and I'm always like, I don't think I can like beat, you know, Warren Buffett or some of these other people. And I really like the set it and forget it 
principle because there's so many other things in life that I want to do, you know, building my own businesses. And I don't want to try to be, you know, the next best investor and, you know, get into, uh, you know, stock picking or even, you know, sector in investing. So I appreciate you kind of walking me through your philosophy because you're totally right. Like tech might be up for the next 10 years, but, you know, if we looked back at like, you know, the the tech bubble, like if I had owned a tech sector, uh, you know, index fund, I would have like been decimated during that time. Whereas like, you know, total U.S. stock market, it would be down, but it would be significantly less down and less right. volatile than a tech fund. Tech stocks drop 90 percent. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. that's that's great depression territory right that's 1929 yeah. kind of kind of stuff uh, so again it's a very volatile thing and and you know 10 years from now we might have another conversation uh, justin and uh, maybe technology will have done just as well or even better than the last 10 years and you'll be saying why did i listen to you because <laughs> yeah. something or some other sector 10 years from now will definitely outperform BTS, BTSAX. I once had a friend of mine who, who said, you know, I'm going to do a test. And he picked out 10 or 15 different asset classes and categories. And he, he said, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to look back historically and track these. And BTSAX, the total stock market, was one of those. He said, I'm going to see which one performs best, you know, over time. And I said, well, I can save you a whole bunch of effort because I can, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. Number one, VTSAX in any given year will never be number one. It's never going to be number one. Number two, VTSAX in any given year is probably going to be fifth, sixth, seventh. It's probably that's the range it's going to be in, right? And number three, all of the others will rotate up and down above and below VTSAX. Sometimes they'll be above it, sometimes they'll be below it. But on average, at the end of that time, I'm willing to say that VTSAX will be at the very top, if not the top, when you look at all the years combined. Yeah. And that just like translates perfectly to the whole idea of the simple path to wealth. Because like if you just buy the market, you don't have to worry about trying to figure out which is you know, the sector or the stock that's going to be performing, you know, the highest over the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, et cetera. You can just buy the whole market and like go focus on all the other important aspects of life. Exactly. So um, a couple kind of uh, follow up questions. I, I know you talked to Google employees. You gave a Google talk at one point. And I'm just curious, can you kind of recount for me and the audience, uh, like, you know, how you were trying to convince those Google employees to sell their Google stock and actually buy VTSAX? <laughs> so that was a couple of things. That was in 2018 where I did the Google talk. And I wasn't trying to convince, I, I, my, I don't try to convince anybody of anything, right? I mean, the only person I've ever tried to convince of this stuff is my daughter. Uh, you know, the rest of it, it's, hey, this is how I see things. You know, this is what I do. This is what I tell my daughter to do. Um, you know, if it resonates with you, then that's great. If it doesn't, I don't care. You know, I mean, it's not going to affect me. Uh, and in fact, I mean, you know, I, a lot of the companies I invest in that I own through VTSAX are catering to those consumers who are going into debt to ma maintain a certain lifestyle. So to a certain extent, what's best for me is that everybody else keep doing that, keep buying all the cars and keep remodeling the kitchens and, and, uh, all that kind of thing from a selfish point of view. Uh, Hassan Minaj wrote the foreword to Pathfinders, and in it he calls me a savage <laughs> because of that comment I made at Google. And, and it came in the Q&A uh, session where one of the employees said, you know, at Google we get stock options, and, you know, I own a lot of Google stock. Is, you know, is being overweight in Google a mistake? 
And what I said was, well, being overweight in any one stock, in my opinion, is yes, it's a mistake and it's a very dangerous thing. And Google is a great company and it's performed extraordinarily well. It may perform extraordinarily well into the future, but it won't last forever because no company lasts forever. Right now, and this is what I was saying to the people at Google and, and then, and I will say the same thing now, right now, there are lots of hungry, aggressive entrepreneurs and other companies trying to figure out how to eat Google's lunch. And it's easy to say, well, they'll never succeed because Google is just too powerful and set in its ways and what have you. And my rebuttal of that is Sears. So Sears, which maybe some of your audience are only vaguely aware of, maybe not at all, but Sears was the Walmart and Amazon combined of its day. Sears was the first retailer who came up with the idea of mailing goods to consumers. And they did that because this goes back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, when a lot of the country was rural. Well, those people living out in rural America couldn't buy a lot of the consumer goods that were coming online because there were no stores that sold them in their little community. There were little general stores that had very limited inventory of, of things. Well, Sears started putting out these catalogs, which they would mail to these rural areas, and then people could order things from the catalog that would be delivered exactly the strategy that Amazon uses. And then Sears began to build brick and mortar stores like Walmart. And Sears dominated the retail landscape. I think in the early 70s, they built what was then called the Sears Tower. It's been renamed tallest building in the world at the time in Chicago. It's hard to imagine how dominant in the retail space this company was. Again, a combination of Walmart and Amazon. Well, most people listening to this, if they know of Sears at all, it's, it's a vague memory. It's almost completely disappeared from the landscape. It had a good hundred year, probably almost a hundred plus year run, but nothing lasts forever. And other aggressive companies came along like Walmart, like Amazon, and just devoured them. Jeff Bezos himself has said he knows that at some point that will happen to Amazon. You know, his job, and of course he's not CEO anymore, but his job when he was, as he said, it was to delay that as long as possible, to keep Amazon hungry as long as possible. And that's the job of the current management, but that's a very difficult thing to do. And so whenever people get worried about companies becoming too dominant, uh, or, or having a monopoly, I, I have no worry at all because no company lasts forever. General Motors in the 1960s, the government was, was seriously debating about breaking up General Motors. And specifically, they were going to force GM to split off the largest division, which was Chevrolet. And the reason for that was in those days, General Motors was so dominant in manufacturing and selling cars that the thought was no company will ever be able to compete with them, and therefore we have to break them up. Well, of course, history tells us two things. One, the government didn't break them up, as it turns out. And two, turns out other car companies, the Japanese in this case, figured out very effectively how to compete against General Motors. Just at the same time, General Motors was probably sitting back saying, yeah, you know, we got it going on. Nobody can compete with us. Probably what the executives of Sears were saying. Yeah, we're so dominant. We don't have to worry anymore. You know, everything has a life cycle. So yeah. that's what I was trying to impart to the people at, at Google. That too yeah. will happen to Google. I don't know when and I don't know who will eat their lunch, but that day will come. And somebody like me will be on some podcast if such things exist at the time saying... Look at Google. Google back in the day. <laughs> Nobody. <thought of> that. <laughs> yeah, it's so true because, you know, just like, you know, no society lasts forever. You know, every society falls, um, you know, at some point, like these companies that are dominating, you know, Google's and Tesla's and stuff like, you know, it may be in 10 years, it may be in 20, it may be in 30. But then if you're 
trying to play that game, you're uh, once again, you're back into trying to time things, which is just, you know, you're putting your, your financial freedom, like, in the territory of like luck, AKA like gambling. And it's just, you know, uh, some people will win doing that. Right. You know, just like some people, you know, uh, hit the jackpot or, you know, uh, win the roulette game. Um, but it's, there's, uh, the simple path to wealth is essentially it will work as long as you follow it. And, you know, some of the times that's going to get people there a lot faster, depending on when you get started and how fast you go. And other times, you know, it'll be slower, but it will eventually get everyone there. Well, something to keep in mind is that fast money, money that comes easily and quickly is fragile money. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few cases in history where somebody comes into money quickly and is able to hang on to it and build it. So you think about, you know, the cryptocurrency uh, um, millionaires, right? I mean, that's came very quickly and it dissipates quickly. You think about athletes, uh, Mike Tyson, who I mentioned in the Simple Path to Wealth made $400 million in his career and wound up bankrupt, you know, huge amount of money coming to somebody who was not prepared to, to handle with it. So money that comes quickly, it looks very appealing from the outside and make no mistake. If anybody wants to send a whole bunch of money quickly to me, I'll accept it. But it's, it's also fragile money. It's very hard to hang on money that's accumulated gradually and strategically like the simple path to wealth calls for, uh, that money has staying power because the people who accumulate it, understand how it was accumulated and the value of it. The other thing, going back to, to the first part of our conversation, that's instructive. Uh, and when I was writing the simple path to wealth, I, th I think it, this is in there, if I remember my timing correctly, but um, the Dow Jones uh, industrial, uh, the Dow Jones industrials, the 30 stocks on that. I used to ask people, you know, how many, of the original Dow Jones companies are still on the Dow Jones index. And the answer used to be one, only one had survived until the day, but around about 2013, 2014, that one, which was GE fell off the Dow Jones because they too, as large and powerful a company as GE was, that also is, it had, no longer was large and powerful enough to still be on the Dow Jones. So the Dow Jones industrial 30 companies that people, when people hear about the Dow Jones did this in the market today, there's not a single company from the original list that is, that is part of it today. Business capitalism is very dynamic and companies come and go. And, and that's part of the beauty of it. That's how we, we make money. And the beauty of an index fund, and this is a term I'm very proud of because I coined it, is it's self-cleansing. So as when Sears was, was doing great, they, I benefited from owning it. When Sears drifted away and Walmart came up and Amazon came up, I didn't have to worry about, Amazon, about Sears drifting away. I, I benefited from the rise. When those two drift away for whatever reason, whatever replaces them, I've benefited enormously from Google being in the index. Well, when the time comes that it drifts away, I don't have to worry about it. It's self cleansing. Yeah. I will own VTSAX forever. I never have to think about when do I need to sell it as you have to do with every, if you own individual companies, you always have to be thinking where in their life cycle are they? How much longer will this continue? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing about single stock investing, uh, you know, I, I do own, you know, from earlier times in my kind of investing career, some like single stocks. And, you know, I have a, a couple that are like, you know, they're above 7% of my portfolio because they've just appreciated so much. Right. But one of the things I think about is like, I don't want to sell them now because I'm in such a high income tax bracket 
and I'll end up paying so, like so much taxes on them. So I'm in this weird situation where I have to like, okay, when do I sell these? And, but then I play the risk of what if I wait till I'm in a lower income bracket. And then by that time they've, you know, gone out of business, you know, like yeah. Sears or, or whatever. And so it's yeah. just like, the, it causes financial stress, like mental stress. Yeah, even, you know, that's a great point, because even if you get it right, it, it you now you now you have a tax lie. I mean, if you own it in a in a, a tax advantaged account, you can dodge that bullet. But if you own it in a taxable account, you know, you have this fairly large, I mean, 20 percent capital gains that you're going to have to give up on on that. So if you've made a million dollars in this stock, well, if you sell it, you got to give your Uncle Sam $200,000. That's a bitter pill to swallow. And so then your your mental process, you're thinking, well, you know, I'm better off hold, holding on to it because I don't think the stock's going to drop 20%. And I know I'm going to lose 20% if I sell it. But that's kind of a trap. Again, the beauty of VTSAX is I don't have to worry about that ever. It just yeah. doesn't matter. I'm just going to always, always own it but with individual stocks. And then unfortunately, you know, that, that is the tax tail wagging the dog. And that typically means people hang on probably longer than they should. And that, you know, they run the risk of, of the stock turning. And of course it doesn't have to go out of business. It just has to start drifting down to, to undo all of that. But, you know, that's that's something to be aware of is even if if you're investing in in individual stocks, even if you get it right, there's that kind of challenge. You know, you have to figure out when to buy it and how long to hold it and then when to sell it. And and then if you sell it, what the tax implications are. And and of course, you, you can say, well, I'll just hold it in a, a tax advantaged account. But if if anybody invests in individual stocks, one of the things you know is they don't always work. And one of the nice things when they don't work is that you have a capital loss when you sell that you can use to offset your capital gains. Well, if they don't work inside of an IRA, uh, you don't have access to that capital loss. Yeah. You'll so I'm it, but you don't have that. You don't, you can't use it in your taxes. Yeah, I'm I'm selfishly interested in your thoughts like in my particular scenario because I do have a few stocks uh like namely like Apple and Facebook that have accumulated, you know, uh like a sizable percentage of my portfolio. Now, I'll be fully transparent. A majority of my portfolio is in like VTS uh VTSAX, but I still have a couple single stock exposures and you know since i have you on the show like how do i think about like unloading these do i just like bite the bullet and do it now and like not watch what they do in the next few years or do i need to wait till i have a year where i don't make as much income like how do i even think through getting like you know getting out of these and getting you know more into index funds well, first of all, my heart goes out to you because I am also a, a former a stock picker. So I, I, I feel your pain and there is no easy answer to that because, you know, when you're a stock picker, you, you have to make that decision. You have to have in your mind, not only when do I buy, but at what point do I sell? And of course that, as we've already talked about at length now, selling has a tax implication to it. So the first thing, and I don't know what your portfolio is, but the first thing I would do if I wanted to unwind from owning individual stocks is if I had any that had losses in them, I would sell those, capture that loss, and then I'd immediately sell it at least as much of my Apple and my Facebook, I think you mentioned, to, to use that loss to offset against those gains. So I'd be unwinding at least part of two positions. But then the other part of the, the equation then becomes a constant analysis of Facebook and Apple. You know, would you buy them today? Where do you think they're going? I mean, do you still think that they're going to, 
and understanding that nobody has a crystal ball, this is extraordinarily hard to do. So I don't look at either of those companies individually, but if I own them, I'd be asking myself, would I buy these today? And do I think, you know, their future is rosy enough to justify it? And of course, the measuring stick is, do I think these companies are going to outperform the index over time? Right? Because it's not just whether they're going to go up, it's are they going to outperform? And to the extent that I thought they were, I might be inclined to hang on to them until maybe I had a better window to get out. But if I didn't think they were going to outperform, if I didn't think I'd, I would buy them today, because the only reason I would buy them today is if I thought they'd outperform, then I'd, I'd probably bite the tax bullet and kick them to the curb and 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 go forth and sin no more. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you bought a single stock? Yeah, so I knew that question was coming. And, and so I'm in, I'm really in no position to criticize somebody who's, what, 41, because I was still buying stocks into my 60s. I had been an index, primarily like you, an index investor, but I still had the disease. So <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. I, I'm going to guess that the, I don't remember the last time I bought one, the more more important question is when, when's the, when did I sell the last of them? And I want to say that was probably just 10 years ago, 2013, 2014. So yeah, I mean, I wish when I, I wish I'd figured this out when I was 41. Yeah. Well, uh, I count myself lucky because, you know, I, you know, I'm 41. There are some people who are going to be stock picking until their 50s, 60s. And, and beyond. And of course, yeah. there are counter examples of people who figure this out, you know, in their 20s and 30s. But um, as far you as know, I'm I concerned. Think, yeah, I, th I think an important thing uh, to point out is I actually achieve financial independence as a stock picker. And by extension, I would I would buy actively managed mutual funds that were run by stock pickers. So that's my dirty little secret, right? I was I probably achieved financial independence in around 89, 90. And I didn't, I didn't convert to index investing probably till around 2000. Um, so it's important for people to understand it's, it's not that indexing works and picking stocks doesn't because it done well, you could make money picking stocks. The important thing to understand is it's, it's not as effective. You know, picking stocks takes a whole lot of time, a whole lot of effort. Uh, you have to not only decide when to buy, but as we've talked about, when to sell. Uh, you can get a good result, but the vast majority of people doing this, and over time, when I say the vast majority of people, and this is professionals as well, you know, it's it's like 1% or, or less can outperform the index. So you're putting in a whole lot of, of time and effort and angst in order to underperform what you could get by buying an index fund and going on and doing other more productive things with your life. But I think what's seductive about it, and frankly, what kept me from embracing indexing sooner, sooner is that stock picking does work. Right. It's only when you put it under the microscope and say, well, you know, what's what's my overall performance doing this, even though I am making money? How does that overall performance compare to the returns I could be getting from the index with no effort at all? And that's a little harder to to do. And the other thing I've noticed is that, you know, humans are good at focusing on their winners because there are a few things that are more intoxicating than choosing a stock and watching it work, right? So that's, and we tend to forget about the ones we chose that didn't work, that didn't go anywhere, or worse yet, went down. But if you're gonna measure your performance, you have to measure it in, in total, in aggregate, you know, all of your stocks, not just your winners. Yeah. Um, do you have time to chat through your thoughts on renting a house versus buying a house? And a, a sure. couple uh, follow-up questions. Sure. So, yeah, I'm just curious, 
you know, because right now, uh, you know, my wife and I, we stayed in a, you know, a pretty crappy house for a while to reach financial independence. We reached financial independence. We now rent a very nice home. And now it's like, okay, do we purchase a home or do we just continue to rent a, a nice home? And I'm just curious, like your thoughts on renting versus buying and like kind of uh, how people can think through this when financial independence is important to them. Right. So first of all, kudos. I think you did it exactly the right way, right? You, you rent a, a modest place when you're building your wealth. And then when you, as you become more established, you know, it's, it's fine upgrading your, your life and running a nicer place. And it's equally fine at some point when you've established your, your wealth to buy a house if that's what you want to do. I see houses as expensive indulgences, uh, not investments. And I wrote a, in fact, the most popular post, popular in the sense of the, of the most read post on my blog, is titled uh, why your house is a terrible investment it has gotten me the most love and it's gotten me the most hate and because home ownership is the american religion you know you tell people that owning their home isn't the best possible thing they could do and a lot of people get very upset with you on that but financially it simply isn't now having said all that i've owned houses for most of my adult life but I never deluded myself into thinking it was a great investment. I bought houses, the houses I bought were houses that I bought because I was willing to pay for a certain lifestyle and I could easily afford it. I could buy them from a position of strength. And that's my recommend. My recommendation is not always rent, never buy a house. My recommendation is never buy a house as an investment, thinking that you're making a good investment because you're just not. And if you're going to buy one, buy it from a position of strength, which means that you can comfortably afford that house. So in your specific uh, situation, I would say, well, if you can comfortably afford a house that is as nice or maybe a little nicer than what you're renting, then sure. And you, and you want to spend your money and you can, you're in a position to do that, then go ahead and do that. If on the other hand, the house you can comfortably afford is maybe not as nice as the apartment that you can afford to rent. Well, now that's a little bit of a different choice. And I don't know that I would necessarily make that choice because again, to go from a nicer apartment for the same money into a less nice house remembering that houses are not good investments, that doesn't make sense to me, right? Because you're giving up lifestyle for what? Yeah. Does yeah, essentially, sense? yeah, it makes sense. Like essentially what we've decided is like, uh, you know, the cool thing about becoming financially independent is if you continue to work and earn money, you you grow wealthier and wealthier and kind of like more financially independent and then each you know quarter or year you can continue to upgrade your lifestyle in lockstep with staying financially independent and so essentially kind of what i and my wife have decided is we live in a very nice house that we rent not even an apartment like a full three bedroom house. And, uh, until we have enough wealth to buy a house that's as nice or nicer while also staying financially independent with that house purchase, like that's when we'll buy the house. And so, you know, similar to you, both my wife and I, we enjoy working. We just don't want to work too much without ever being able to take breaks. Right. And so, you know, that's the power of financial independence is we can, you know, work a four day work week or take a month off or, you know, a one or two year sabbatical or whatever we want. Um, because as long as we don't inflate our lifestyle, we can, you know, maintain our current lifestyle in perpetuity, even if we stop earning money, but we haven't stopped earning money. So our, you know, our financial 
independence continues to grow in the the sense that we can live at a higher and higher level uh, cost of living level. Right. So you're getting financially stronger all the time. One of the things that's important to think about is, you know, it's if you follow the simple path to wealth, you will become wealthy, right? I mean, that's that. And and what people don't necessarily recognize is what's very hard to see is the power of compounding. Because if you look at a graph of something compounding, you'll see that it, it kind of bumps along the bottom, very gradually rising. And then all of a sudden it takes this big spike. That's how compounding works. I've had conversations with people who show me their numbers. They'll, they'll show me their net worth. Here's a great example. I had a conversation with somebody who was worth $5 million. So she was showing me her assets to total up to $5 million. I said, great. That's meaningless without knowing how much you spend as to whether or not you're financially independent. And she said, well, I spend $100,000 a year. And her question was, am I financially independent? By the way, she was a banker, a very successful, intelligent woman who could certainly do the basic math. And that's all we're talking about. Well, if you use four, the 4% 4 rule as a guideline, right? If you have, if, if you're spending $100,000, you need two and a half million dollars to be financially independent because two and a half million dollars throws off at 4%, 100,000. She had double that. And she certainly knew that. She was smart enough to know the math. And, and I've had so many conversations like this. I've come to the conclusion that people know what the numbers are telling them, but they can't quite believe it because it happens what so suddenly, or it feels like it's, it's sudden. So, you know, if you aspire to own fancy cars and fancy houses, and you don't want to be continually in debt paycheck to paycheck to do it, if you start on a path of building your wealth, at some point, these things will be pocket change. You'll be able to do it from a, from a wonderful position of strength. You know, I was in Ecuador with Mr. Money Mustache a number of years ago, and we were walking into town to a bodega to buy some wine, and he'd been to this place before I hadn't. So at one point, as we're coming up to the store, I said to him, you know, how much does the wine here cost? And he said, it's free. And I said, his name is Pete. I said, Pete, it's not free. I know things are inexpensive in Ecuador, but the shop owner is going to expect us to give him some money before we walk out out of his store with the, with the wine and how much money is he going to be expecting? And he said, JL, no, 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 you misunderstand me. He said, what I mean is that when you achieve a certain level of wealth, like you and I have, everything's free. And that was an epiphany for me because I never thought about it quite that way. But it's kind of the same concept from a very simple little book that was written 100 years ago called The Richest Man in Babylon, which is a series of parables about the richest man in Babylon. And he talks about having a purse filled with coins and it's always overflowing. So no matter how many coins you spend, there are always more coins left over. It's the same concept. If you have enough invested, no matter how much you spend, your money is making more than that. It's replacing what you spend and then some, which is your situation. It sounds like you're becoming steadily wealthier, even as you are spending money. And that's what Pete meant when he said everything is free. Now, yeah. for me personally, I can't go out and buy yachts and airplanes and what have you. But, you know, when I go out to dinner, it's pretty much free. Uh, you know, whatever whatever I can reasonably think of to buy, with a car or whatever, it's reasonably free because my investments are going to replace that money and then some. Yeah. So this... I think this is a good segue to this one passage you have in the book uh, that I really popped out for me. Um, and, and I'll just read it. It's rags to riches to rags in three generations, as the saying go, goes. 
According to a re recent survey, only 2% of today's millionaires come from the upper class. Another 19% come from the upper middle class. 79% come from the middle class and below. This is, of course, runs counter to the popular narrative that most wealth is inherited. And I've just been thinking through that in my own journey. And, you know, like for people who come from wealthy families or come from poor families and then become wealthy, like how do you how do you ensure that you pass on like if if you're someone who was raised in a poor family and you achieve financial independence, how then do you ensure that like your children don't bring bring the family back to rags? Like I just like that. I've been like tussling with that in my mind and I just unsure how to answer that question. So I'm curious how you think about it because I know you have your daughter and you've worked very hard to, you know, educate her. So how do you think about that? So great question. Uh, you touched on a couple of different things. Just like we were talking about earlier, I don't worry about companies becoming so big that nobody can compete, can compete against them. Because in the natural course of events, that truly never happens. So I don't think the government ever needs to worry about breaking up companies. The market will do that of its own. That's the same reason I don't worry about uh, wealth inequality, income inequality, because, you know, the, the people who worry about that make this assumption that once a family becomes wealthy, they stay wealthy forever. And therefore, you know, nobody else is going to get a chance. Well, that's just not the way the world actually works. You know, the way the world actually works is that rags to riches to rags and three generations it doesn't always happen that way, but it, it does frequently. I, I recently uh, saw read an exchange that Charlie Munger, who of course is Warren Buffett's partner who passed away recently here, but evidently he, he was asked the question, of course he was a billionaire, you know, if, uh, Charlie, if you, if you, you said, Charlie, are you going to give your children an inheritance? And he, Charlie says, yes. And the questioner says, well, isn't that going to sap their ambition and work ethic? And Charlie said, yes. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, aren't you worried about that? And he said, well, I am worried about it, but the alternative is you don't give it to them and they hate you. So that's kind of a trap that wealthy people fall into because there's almost no way to pass on wealth without it sapping some vitality from the people you're passing it on to, which is why, again, I don't worry about, you know, this is if you're worried about people, families accumulating too much wealth, it's very hard for that to pass wealth on successfully for generation to generation. And even if you successfully do that, well, as the generations expand, that wealth is, is gets dissipated against more and more people, right? Because, you know, people have children. So even if you manage to pass it on to your children and they pass it on to their grandchildren, which are going to be more than them, and they pass it on to their great grandchildren, and there's this expanding group of people that are pulling on this same wealth. You see this with the Kennedys, you see it with the Fords, you know, some of these fortunes that have passed down longer than one might otherwise expect. So that's why I don't particularly worry about it. Uh, in terms of our own daughter, I, th I think we've been fairly lucky in that she is making her own way successfully. She's got a successful career. I attribute that in part to the fact that we always lived so far below our means that she didn't grow up in an uber wealthy environment. When we, when she was a teenager, we lived in a pretty wealthy neighborhood because it had a good school system. Uh, frankly, our net worth was probably more than a lot of our neighbors, but the lifestyle we projected wasn't. So when she was turning 16, she was campaigning hard for me to buy her a car. And, you know, part of her argument was all my friends are getting cars on their 16th birthday, which I'm sure was true. 
uh, but she didn't get a car on her 16th birthday. And my response was, hey, that's great. If all your friends have cars, you won't have any trouble getting rides. Right? So I think those kinds of things happen. But, you know, short of, of living a more modest lifestyle that the kid grows up experiencing, uh, I, I don't know really how you, how you am like, kind of like with Charlie Munger, you know, you just sort of have to accept, that, especially if you have very large wealth, you have to accept that, you know, you're probably going to leave it to your kids, or at least a big portion of it. Your kids probably know that. And yeah, your kids are probably not going to have the fire in the belly that you had. The only consolation to that is that all of us live a much more luxurious life than our great grandparents did. You know, and so every generation, the world has gotten wealthier and wealthier. There's a wonderful book called Factfulness, which just talks about how much better on every tangible measure you can think of the world has gotten. You know, the world has never been better than it is today. That, you know, our 24 hour news cycle would have you believe otherwise. But factually, the world has never, we've never been wealthier. In many ways, we've never been more dissatisfied, probably because of that news cycle. But, you know, if we went back and tried to live the lives of our great grandparents or our grandparents or even our parents, we'd be a little bit appalled. There's been so many advances in society. I can remember uh, when I was a kid, my mother used to obsess about not getting a cut infected because when she was a little girl, there were no antibiotics. And there were lots of cases where cuts would get infected, would fester, and people died. Well, by the time I was a kid, uh, you know, there were antibiotics, but in her mind, that was still this huge risk. We don't think about that kind of thing anymore, right? So yeah. anyway, so maybe the fact that our kids have it easier than us is not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Okay. Kind of two last questions that I have before, uh, I ask kind of the end of, um, the show questions. Um, let's say somebody is making good money, you know, $175,000 and, uh, but they're kind of living at that, uh, extreme end of like, you know, spending a lot of what they're making, you know, buying the fancy cars, purchasing a home, and they're just not really uh, creating any like real financial freedom with themselves, meaning like they're essentially going to have to work until they're, you know, 60, 70 or, or older if they, they keep it up. How would you go about like, you know, I want to say convincing, I don't know if that's the right word, but like encouraging them to, you know, rethink things and start to set themselves up for financial freedom or financial independence. So as I said earlier, I, I, I make it a policy. I don't try to convince anybody of anything. So <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I don't argue with somebody like that. And I have, but I have had conversations with people like that because they'll, they'll hear about the idea of financial independence. And of course, what's not to like, right? I mean, who, who's going to say, no, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be financially independent. I don't want to have money that's making money. Of course, we all want that. The problem comes when you sit down with somebody like you described and you say, well, okay, if this is what you want, you're going to have to reorganize your life because you're going to have to free up some of your income that you have been spending on all these other things to begin buying your freedom. Right. So you're going to have to make some different choices in how you're spending your money. And then frequently what I will hear is, well, that sounds great, except that, you know, uh, I have to have the two least luxury cars and my kids have to go to the private schools and we have to live in this house, you know, this fancy house in this fancy neighborhood. And I've come to think of this as the tyranny of the must haves. You know, I must have this and, you know, I, yeah, I want to be financially independent, but I must have this. I must have this. Well, the more must haves you have in your life, the less likely you are to be financially independent. The only way anybody ever becomes financially independent is when the single most important 
must have they have in their life, or at least within the top two, is buying their freedom. So if you're not willing to shift your spending from all those other things into buying assets, well, you know, there's nothing I can say to you that is going to make it make a difference. There is no magic bullet that will allow you to keep spending the money, your money, the way you've been spending it and also be financially independent. Yeah. And that answers my second question, which was similar, just a different scenario is essentially it comes down to mindset, you know, and, and values. So if you're, you know, if your number one or number two value is not your personal freedom, no information or convincing or conjoling is, is gonna like get you on the path to financial independence. So, you know, basically it's a question of like, is financial freedom or freedom a top core personal value for you or not? And if it's not, then financial independence is probably not for you and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that is what you say or want to be one of your top core personal values, well, then we have some reorganization of priorities. Uh, You know, we got to get your uh, words aligned with your actions and your lifestyle, because right now they're out of alignment. If you're saying that freedom is your number one or number two top. And the value. other thing is if, if it is your priority if being financially independent is your priority, you know, as many of the stories in pathfinders illustrate, you don't have to have a large income to get there. There are lots of stories in pathfinders that people have very modest incomes who are achieving it. And I think that's an important takeaway for people to understand is just having a high income doesn't mean you're going to become wealthy. We've already discussed there are lots and lots of cases of people who have very high incomes who are never going to be financially independent. So a high income alone doesn't get you there. And a modest income doesn't keep you from getting there. If you have your priorities set to that's, that's what you want. And I agree, you know, if, if, you know, I don't try to convince anybody of anything, I kind of put the information out there. Um, If it resonates with you, now, you know, this is something you could do. Now, you know, that of all the things you could buy with your money, this is, this is an option. It's your money. It's your life. If you choose to buy your freedom, then that's great. If you choose not to, that's entirely your choice. The only caveat I would have on that is I don't want to hear from you in 20 or 30 years whining that you, you have to keep working, right? And that, you know, you don't want to work anymore, that you want to be retired and you want to travel. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, and I do feel for people who never were introduced to the idea that this was an option to buy your freedom. I feel bad for them when they come at the later stages of their life and they're kind of stuck. But you know, as I said, if you read Pathfinders, you you will have no excuses going forward. Yeah. And that's, I think, the key takeaway for me is, you know, in earlier in life, I didn't like I knew subconsciously like freedom was my number one personal value. I just have always known that. Um, right. And within that is financial freedom you know, to live, you know, life on my own terms. But it wasn't until I discovered, you know, your work and financial independence that I was like, wait a minute, my actions aren't aligned, you know, with my values. And I actually have a choice and subconsciously I've been choosing to not have freedom. But then once I discovered financial independence, I said, I'm going to realign my life and consciously and proactively choose freedom as much as possible. Right. I I couldn't say it better myself. (laughs) So as we wrap this up, I like to ask every guest um, to share one tip, tool, or strategy for money, one for health or fitness, and one for life. And you shared a lot uh, here, but 
um, in closing, if you would wouldn't mind, you know, kind of leaving a, 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 a takeaway or a leave behind for the audience. Um, Sure. Well, I think in terms of money, we've we've kind of covered a lot of that, right? Yeah. So I think we we kind of beat the money one to death. <laughs> uh, in terms of fitness and health, uh, that's an area I wish I had. If I'd known I was, as the old saying goes, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Uh, so I, that's an area where where I haven't been stellar. And my suggestion would be, if I could go back in time, is to start young, focusing on your diet and your fitness and and then just maintain it. Just like as we alluded to earlier, if you start early investing, then you have time for that to compound and make you make you fiscally stronger and stronger. And I think the same thing, if you start early with an awareness of exercising and eating right, and you don't develop some of the bad habits that frankly I developed over the years, then you don't have to unwind those bad habits to try to recapture your health, which is what I'm in the process of doing. And then in terms of the life one, uh, again, thinking if I could go back in time to my younger self, uh, I think what I would say is don't worry so much. Uh, you know, if you follow the simple path to wealth, Compounding will work for you, and compounding is extraordinarily powerful. So if you follow the simple path to wealth, you will, in fact, become wealthy. So you really don't have to worry about it. You just have to keep putting one step in front of the other. You just have to keep systematically investing in VTSAX or a similar broad-based low-cost index fund, and you will get there, and it'll be extraordinarily powerful. And every step along the way, you'll be a little bit stronger. Awesome. Yeah. It's always fun thinking through like, what would I tell my younger self? So right. I appreciate, and it's really cool. Like, uh, I love that you tied the two, uh, together with the, the money, um, and the health is like, if you develop good money habits, uh, early, you don't have to unwind them later. And if you d develop good health habits early, you don't have to unwind them later. And, you know, I think I'm, I like to think of myself, I had really bad financial habits up until like my 30s. So it's never like, in a sense, too late to unwind them, but you do have to make the choice. And so like the sooner you realize that there is a, a opportunity for you to unwind some, you know, poor money or health, uh, lifestyle habits, the sooner you can like, you know, get on a path that is going to then serve you for the rest of your life. So jail, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, you recently re released this brand new book, Pathfinders, uh, which is just a packed full of ton of different people, about a hundred people who are pursuing financial independence or already financially independent. So if you're looking for some inspiration in your own financial independence journey, like I highly recommend get JL's book available wherever books are sold. And uh, JL, if people want to connect with you online, what's the best place to send them? Probably the blog, which is jlcollinsnh.com. Uh, and then from there, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook. Great. Awesome. Well, JL, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's, it's been a pleasure. I've had a lot of fun hanging out with you. Thanks for having me.